professor naila kabir uh, the employment guarantee schemes in especially in india are those that do not improve any skilling provide any skilling for the people it's just an assurance of some kind of work to the people so that they 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 do not they do not suffer from seasonal employment uh, provided in agriculture so uh, these programs the long term objectives of these programs should be that the demand for such work should go to zero that should be the long term objectives of the government so do, what do you think are the, or your comments on it drawing on from the maharashtra guarantee scheme the maharashtra is one of the richest states in india but still you see that the, there is still demand for the employment guarantee scheme in maharashtra which itself points to something some failures of the government in other ways so i would like to have your comments on this thank you thank you i have a question to santiago levi uh, in the uh, if if one thinks about the tax transfer system's responses to the lack of formal employment in the in the developed country setup there's been an extension of the so called in work benefits like the eitc system in the in, in your neighboring country in in, in the us uh, how do you see the role potential role of these sort of systems uh, for for fostering uh, formal employment in 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 middle income countries like mexico Thank you for this very really excellent presentation. Uh, the first question is to San Diego. You said that you have a strictly selection for your beneficiaries. How? Uh, yeah, because uh, the similar uh, minimum uh, living standard guarantee program was uh, experimented, uh, implemented in China, but in the very poor area, it's very difficult for the uh, mean test. Uh, yeah, you understand uh, the, our problem. So the strictly se selection becomes uh, election by the village. Yeah. And the uh, second question is uh, to uh, Francis. Uh, it's to me not so quite clear why the subsidy for children up to 18 years and uh, how it's only cash and to understand the similar program implemented in china that uh, the, the f food uh, the food directly provided to the children and two years old and also school feeding program was implemented in the schools, but not uh, definitely cash. And also, I, uh, so uh, the first question that related also for the yesterday's, that what is the impact of your social guarantee program to the labor market participation? Uh, and the third question to Nella, uh, that uh, uh, since India has uh, also fast growth, I don't know what is uh, the impact of uh, fast growth on the employment. Uh, because uh, in the China case, uh, that uh, the public works are still going on, but uh, the most of uh, poor families are relying on migrate to cities to get their jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Address to Santiago, but uh, others may want to kick in. Um, these experiences that you have been referring to have also been happening at the same time where sort of at the global international level. We've had discussions about Millennium Development Goals setting debates, uh, trying to synthesize experiences and so on. And now we are approaching a point where we are thinking about a post-2015 uh, development agenda. And I, I'm just sort of wondering, is there one sort of key message or lesson that you would say from your experience moving forward, what, what, sort, of the, what sort of the key insight that you, that, 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 that you would focus on? And, and, and I'll give just a little bit of, 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 of the background from some of the internal wider discussions that we've had, because we are right now moving from one work program to the next. 
And um, we, we have been sort of struggling with these issues and, and, and we do want to come out in a balanced way thinking about, on the one hand, uh, social protection programs and so on, but then also on the other hand, on the fundamental issues related to uh, economic transformation, structural transformation and so on. And I was sort of sensing that was a little bit of this in, in the background of the presentations and then let me put it very pointedly, are we wrong when we insist on saying transformation, inclusion as sustainability, is that the right way to uh, how can you say, or is this just too much uh, an, an old-fashioned economist who keeps uh, insisting on, on, on that? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Vin. I must say I really enjoyed all the three presentations. Uh, my question is to Dr. Kabir. It's a pleasure to be interacting with you again. Um, it was a very comprehensive analysis that you give of both Narega and the... Um, uh, TUP program in Bangladesh and uh, if I understand correctly in your presentation you um, uh, showcased how there have been positive impact uh, or there's been a transformative impact on the lives of women in India whereas in Bangladesh the results were not so uh, positive on the contrary fairly negative negative. and uh, so my question is that um, uh, what would be your uh, advice uh, in terms of taking a program like this forward? Uh, um, because we are right now in conversations around having a similar program in Vietnam. So, uh, what uh, you know, what should be or what should be the safeguards or what is really uh, the good practices that we should certainly keep in mind when talking about the design to the delivery uh, piece completely? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm Richard Marshall from the UNDP office here in, in Vietnam. I had uh, questions for Santiago and for Nyla. Um, I think to Santiago, I'm asking the kind of question that two people have already asked, and I was, um, uh, you know, very interested actually in what you, what you came to at the end of your presentation, where you alluded to uh, how you saw. Um, you know, the separation of social insurance, social protection, in fact, the, ab the abolition of that term. Could, I'm asking, could you elaborate more? Because it, it strikes me that this um, incentive um, incom incompatibility you described would apply to any um, social assistance program delivered alongside a social insurance program. That, and that kind of conclusion runs against, I guess, what is an emerging orthodoxy in social protection. So if, if you could elaborate more on exactly what you would do uh, with, with opportunities now um, to resolve the problem you described. And to Naila, I, want, I wanted to ask, um, I have some experience of Bangladesh, I was in Bangladesh before here, um, uh, on, on TUP in particular. On, one thing you didn't mention was the, the, the fiscal dimension of TUP, because TUP is a, is a BRAC delivered, not a government delivered program. And it's essentially, is it still a, donor, a de facto donor-delivered program? You know, DFID, for example, is giving very large amounts of money to, to BRAC, uh, essentially as a kind of budget support to an NGO. And I'm certain some of that is finding its way into delivering TUP, even if it's not directly paying transfers. Um, and I was interested, you mentioned RMP. There was the, the follow-on EU program, I think, called REOPA, which was a, a part UN-delivered program as well. Uh, which had very strong, echo the kind of results you found. But that program was even more expensive than TUP. You know, the unit costs in that program are over $1,000 a client. So I, you talk about sustainability and scale-up and transfer. I, I just wonder, is it possible for governments like uh, Bangladesh to afford these kind of programs? For uh, analysis of the unemployment, on the formal, informal uh, relationship as it relates to opportunities. I think that what we would want to see is see the share of the young generation within the formal sector. Because when you take a large group like goes 16 to 50 years old or even older, uh, the bulk of that group is pre-opportunities and didn't benefit from that. That said, the logic of your argument is so strong that I suspect you would find the same thing, but I think that we should do that. Now the previous, uh, a question was asked you, what would you do about opportunities? I'd like to ask you, what would you do for Securo Popular to avoid that incentive effect? That is there anything that you can do to maintain, in a sense, what Securo Popular is trying to do and yet doesn't give that negative incentives to the informal sector? Thank you. Um, I mean, you have to think about different con institutional contexts of the United States to, to Mexico and Latin America. But the broad point, I think, is right. The way I think about it is 
there's a structure of incentives that is yielded by income taxes, value added taxes, you know, the whole set of taxation. Plus, if you really think about it, labor taxation, both positive and negative, positive in the sense of, you know, labor taxes for contributions and negative because there are subsidies depending on some kind of labor status. So there's an array of, of incentives coming in from the whole set of things that the government is doing. And what we observe is that that incentive structure is actually favoring resources to shift into the informal sector. So you want to shift it. And you want to shift it. And if whatever mechanism that reduces the value of informality and increases the value of formality to firms and workers is welcome. Um, whether I would do it through an in earned income tax credit kind of thing or something else, you have to think about the context of, of the details of Mexico. But the broad idea, yes, that's, that's the, where you want to move. Uh, there was a question about targeting. Um, so the way, the way it works in Mexico, it's a very data intensive process. So we gather information about every single household that can potentially be a beneficiary of the program. And the way the targeting is done is we look at indicators of physical assets of the household. Do they have cement floor or not have cement floor? Is there water in the household or there's no water? Do they have a bicycle? Sort of physical assets of the household. Human capital of the household, female-headed, male-headed, both parents only, you know, or only the grandparents, how many children, the ages, the education. And on the basis of that, we use some kind of statistical technique to come up with points, and then that's the way the targeting is done. Um, there are statistical problems because of exclusion and inclusion errors, and, but in, in general it has worked well. Whether it would work in other environments, I don't know, because you, you need to gather a lot of data, and whether this would be enough to separate households with some degree of confidence, I don't know. It might make sense in some cases to do geographical targeting altogether and, and not do this kind of targeting. I couldn't really opine about the situation of China. So, so let me take Phil's question and, and a little bit with, with Richard's question, and, and then I'll touch on, on, on lastly by, by Elizabeth. So the message that I take from all this is from the point of view of poverty, you certainly do want to have income transfer programs. You certainly want to increase current consumption. You want to do this in a way that is intentionally consistent so that eventually you don't have to do it because ideally you would like to end poverty. So, so you have to think about these programs as transitory. What makes these programs transitory is some underlying change in the conditions that generates the need for the program. That has to do with the income generating process. So I separate the poverty program, the Progresa program, which I would continue until those conditions have changed. This program needs to continue. Progress opportunities needs to continue. And these income transfers need to continue. And you can do it targeted. You know, there are many details about that. But the income transfer needs to continue. The real problem, as I see it, at least in Latin America and at least in Mexico, I don't know if this is true everywhere else, is in the income generating part, the labor market that is not generating the higher real wages and the better jobs. So focus on that. Now, what you have in the labor market is a divide in the way that social insurance is structured because you've imported a concept from Germany in the 19th century that has very little to do with the reality of Latin America in the 21st century, which is fund social insurance through a labor tax. If you think about it as a fiscal issue, you ask yourself a question, why is it that I have to fund social insurance from a labor tax? Why can't I fund social insurance from something else? So my coming down is we need to move to universalistic systems of social insurance in which the provision of protection against risks that are common to all workers should be funded from the same source of revenue. So if all workers face health risks, all workers should be having health protection, health insurance from the same source of revenue. That revenue cannot be a wage tax because not everybody is a wage worker and because you induce a lot of wage behavior. So I, I come in the direction of leave the poverty programs while they're needed, but on the social insurance, move in the direction of universal social provision. Whether you want to call this social protection or not, I don't know, because it's, it's kind of the terminology means different things for different people. That's why I think we shouldn't use that word. I say 
universal social insurance for everybody, funded from a sustainable source of revenue that is independent of labor status, keep the social, the, the poverty programs while they're needed. That, that's the answer, at least it. Merge Seguro Popular plus all these other health programs, merge them with the programs that you already have for formal workers. I didn't have a time to discuss about this, but in Latin America, we have a lot of evidence of workers moving between the informal and the formal sector. There's a lot of transit between workers. So it's a crazy system of insurance to provide you with insurance of this kind when you're formal and of this kind when you're informal, when you're the same person. So suppose I sell to you house insurance that covers your house in the summer and the spring, but not in the winter and the fall. What kind of a health insu house insurance is that? What kind, of, what kind of health insurance is one? If you get this job, you get it, and if you don't get this job, you don't get it. So it's these incentives that you want to get rid of. So moving in the direction of, 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 of sort of universalistic, and if you think about it then, it turns into a fiscal issue. What other source of revenue that is less distortionary of firms and workers' behavior can I raise and that align, aligns incentives? Ravi has some very nice papers about you have to define formality and informality with regards to a particular regulation. Here it's being used with a regulation coverage of contributory social insurance. If I push the point and I now fund all social insurance from the same source of revenue, I've got rid of the words formal and informal. They're no longer meaningless. They're, they're meaningless. They're workers with different degrees of productivity, but they all have the same social insurance. And so that's, the, I think, the direction where you want to move. Your point about the younger workers is correct, but I've done the numbers. I didn't have time to show it. It's actually troublesome because um, there's no change in the younger cohorts vis-a-vis -vis the older cohorts. Even the younger cohorts of workers that have more human capital than the older cohorts of workers are going into the informal sector. And then they're rationally responding to some incentives. Uh, there are many other things that I didn't discuss, taxes, you know, and, and sort of small regimes for small, tax regimes for small enterprises that also distort behavior. But social insurance, you know, these, we're talking about 2% of GDP. And then the associated tax on the contributory side is about 1.5% of GDP. These are large numbers, you know, numbers in the order of 3 4% of GDP will certainly change a lot of behavior, much more than the behavior that is changed by Progreso Oportunidades. So I, I close here. Progreso Oportunidades was a nice innovation. In my view, it's been overblown. I think countries begin to, it's enough. It's not a substitute for fixing social insurance. It's a good mechanism to transfer income to the poor. But if you really want to think about serious development and transformation, you've got to move on from these programs that they should continue, but now you need to tackle the problems in the labor market and the problems in the design of social insurance and taxation. And that is where I think the agenda in Latin America, I, I can't speak about other parts of the world, needs to move to. Sadly, what is going on is that governments got enamored of CCTs and they can always increase the transfer and not deal with this problem, which is what we should not be doing. Thank you. Thank you, Santiago. Francis? Hmm. Do you think when you, Santiago, that the incentives are kind of con to switch from formal to informal are contained within Mexico? I mean, is it, I, I think you're looking inside Mexico for some of the effects of the social of, of, the, of the social spending, rather than could some of it be being there? There global forces at work. They're, they're, we know that there are. I mean, we're feeling it in South Africa, for instance, with Walmart just coming and things like that, where 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 one might want to look beyond these sort of containment to these particular programs. I've, I've, and I think it's the same part of me which which wanted to say to your slide. I, I will get onto the question of this. <laughs> um, um, that at, on your very last slide, almost people, the younger people must. Th we hope that they will find more productive jobs. I think that you must also say they people must will have to learn, and that's about the skills you were talking right. about to make more. Pr there's not jobs to be found, and part of the the the, the, the trick is in in accepting that that the for the future of so many young people, especially unskilled, it'll be making their own jobs. Um, may I just answer your question? Why the age extension to, to 18? I think that there are a number of answers, and Harun might, uh, Borat might um, 
might um, add to them. But it, partly it was because the old state maintenance grant had been for children up to the age of 18. So people thought, oh, we've lost such a lot. Um, we must have what we had then back, not understanding that the purpose of this one, and it was government and the committee's fault um, in not articulating it better. This was a different purpose of, reach, of, of, of mitigating poverty with, for, for a very small group, smaller group of young people. There was trade union politics involved, um, there, there were a, 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 it, the, the, and there was also a, a very strong lobby group um, in the country who were talking about um, wanting to promote the idea of a basic income grant. Um, very much um, uh, under the mentorship, in a sense, of Guy Standing at the, at the ILO. And I think there was a thought there, if you could pull the old age pension age back down and then push the child support <laughs> grant up, you've, you've already sort of done about a third of the problem. The, um, it was the cash child support grant was meant to be part of a battery of programs promised by government, one of which was certainly nutrition, and there is a school feeding scheme that goes on at the moment, but it wasn't hooked into it. it this was a separate, unconditional program with the, with the likelihood that the, the vast bulk of that money would be spent on, um, on, on, on food, as, as is the case. And on the um, employment... Um, Labour market participation, I think your question was for, for all the grants, not for the child support grant, just. And, and for the, I mean, there's clear evidence for the pension for elderly people of when the pension comes in, to, especially to an older w woman, that younger women in that household will go out seeking for work. There's also a, a, a employment a, around the pension days, as I, as I a, a alluded to. Um, and you can see on the pension days the amount of money that is getting exchanged before the pensioner goes away with her, his or her money in terms of buying bricks, um, getting resources here to go and sell there, um, getting shoes fixed, whatnot. And, and I don't think any of that is counted in our... It, it doesn't, we've, got, we've got relatively very good um, labour force surveys, but we don't get near... I think labour force surveys find it hard to get at that at that level of stuff. Thank you for that time. Naila? Um, <clears throat> I think both uh, Santiago and uh, Franci were, you know, stated that the, the transfers they were talking about were not employment generation schemes. But I think what I would say is these employment-oriented programs are not substitutes for employment-generating growth. They exist because although both Bangladesh and India, much more so, have had extremely positive rates, strong rates of growth, we've also seen inequalities rising considerably in both countries. And I was very uh, struck by Harun's slide yesterday that showed the difference that was made to the income distribution in South Africa because of transfers mm. from the very rich to the very poor. So until we get broad-based growth, that generates enough work for people to be able to work their way out of poverty, until we don't have these uh, distress migration because there's no jobs in the places that you are, the state steps in as an employer of last resort. And I, I can't see any uh, move away from that, you know, if these other conditions are not met. Um, the other, what the advice to uh, replicating TUP, I think, you know, I was very worried when Vietnam Women's Union replicated the Grameen approach in, in Vietnam. And the reason I was worried is that the Grameen Bank approach was developed in a country where women had no tradition of entrepreneurship, no tradition of handling money, and had to be, you know, trained into it. In Vietnam, you have a strong tradition of female entrepreneurship, and therefore, you know, sort of siphoning women off into microcredit programs rather than mainstreaming them into, you know, the, seemed to me a mistake. Similarly, I think, with the TUP, it is developed for extremely poor women in an extremely poor country with a very unresponsive government. So one can take aspects of the TUP, and I think uh, if you have got very destitute women in Vietnam who find it hard to, you know, aspire, have the capacity to aspire and plan and so on, one can think of, you know, programs that would work with them, alongside them. What I was very struck with in West Bengal, because the program that was 
implementing TUP in West Bengal that I studied, was it added the self-help group model to TUP. And therefore, you didn't have women isolated within the home doing you know, little bits of enterprise. You had women who were members of groups who were able to save and borrow from each other as they you know, progressed. And both the studies from West Bengal, both uh, Abhijit Banerjee's and ours, were very positive about the West Bengal uh, model. So I think it's very important not to replicate the TUP in every sense of the word, but to work out if what aspects of it are relevant to Vietnam. And I think the, the, the fiscal question, as far as I know, the government has taken over the RMP. I don't know how well it's doing, but I, I understood that it was handed over to the government in 2006. However, the issue of the fiscal, it goes back to the issue of growth. You know, at some stage, the Bangladesh government uh, will have to show willing, uh, well, it has shown willing in investing in various kinds of programs. Whether it will want to take on something as expensive and, and resource intensive as TUP, I am not sure. And it may be that it will be, continue to be a civil society type program because it works at the very grassroots. However, um, what I think was very good about the rural maintenance program, first of all, of course, it had an exit option built in for women. It only lasted for four years. I would like to know how long people continue to work on the NREGS. You know, they continue year after year after year. And the subsequent evaluations of RMP participants was that there was some degree of sustainability in their livelihoods. So that in the long run, those women will not perhaps need the kind of help that existing poor women need. But um, yes, in the end, it is a political question whether the government wants to take, take these programs on or not. Not necessarily a fiscal one. Thank you, Naila. Um, well, I just want to thank you for coming to this session, and I want to thank our speakers for this brilliant discussions on social protection. Thank you very much. Thank you.